the videos on. We're gonna copy the lecture, so I have a copy of it and I have it tape recorded and I use dropbox.com. Um, so, let's see if I have anything else to show you. Show and tell. Those paintings, Rookmacher did his PhD on Gauguin, and that's a Gauguin painting. Mm. And that's a painting he mentions in his PhD on Gauguin, that's uh, Goya. And the name yeah. of that uh, painting is El Sueño de la Razón Produce Monstruos. The sleep of reason produces monsters. As uh, some kind of contemplation of the enlightenment, what reason has done to man. And uh, it's the sleep of the rational man, the enlightened man, dreaming gives him visions of monsters. Anyway, it's this sort of language that is what people are really looking for when you talk about art. I could talk about the flat theology. The last time I was here, I picked this up on Amazon.com. That's the complete works of Hans Ruckmacher on CD-ROM. It cost me $14.99, and it has everything on it. So that's my show and tell. I thought I'd do some more showing and telling because Ruckmacher like that. Um, today is Mardi Gras, which Ruckmacher would have hated. You know why? Because it's exactly what he talked about, the division of life. That there would be a holy part of life and a profane part of life. Today is Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday. Today is the day of the flesh. Yesterday was the day of the flesh. Mardi Gras, Greasy Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> and then today is the day of the spirit, uh, Ash Wednesday, the, the day of the uh, convent, the uh, seclusion, where the Christian separates himself from the, from the flesh. Mm. Rookmarker would have considered this uh, absurd, that one day you're, you're profane and the next day you're holy. <laughs> One day you're in Greasy Tuesday, and the next day you're in Lent. So this rep would have represented <laughs> what he describes as the division of life um, that was unwholesome after the Enlightenment and produces a lot of despair and anxiety. And I noticed that today in the New York Times, uh, they are selling one a copy of Edvard Munch's The Scream, and they think they'll get $80 million for it. But it is a picture of um, uh, angst and despair, and the lonely, solitary character screams at you. I always think it was, because I'm a little bit, I'm a humorist, I think. I, I always think that the picture is about a uh, Norwegian boardwalk and there's a sort of middle-aged man and then two Norwegian beauties come walking up to him in bikinis <laughs> and he goes, ah! So <laughs> <laughs> Edvard Munch has such a heavy element of, of sexy, beautiful Norwegian women. So here's the expression, you know, what do I do now? This is so good looking. But anyway, that's the scream, it's on sale today. And this is the sort of thing that forms the background or, you know, the, the feeling of modern art with the anxiety and despair. And um, I, there's a great story I like. Uh, have you ever read Joseph Conrad, read Heart of Darkness? It, well, he wrote a story once called uh, Prince Andre. And in the story, Prince Andrei is an aristocrat in uh, Poland, and he has a lot of land and a lot of money, but he takes a very unpopular political uh, position. As a consequence, they come to him and say, are you sure you don't want to retract this position? He says, no, that's my position. And they say, well, we're sorry, well, we have to arrest you. So they arrest him, 
and they put him in a salt mine. And there he is, aristocratic Prince Andre, working in the salt mines. And while he's in the salt mine, they approach him several times more. Prince Andre, we respect your position. You're a man of honor. Everyone respects you. Are you sure you wouldn't like to adjust your position a bit and then we'll release you? No, that's my position. So he stays in the salt mine 17 years. And then there's a change of, um, uh, you know, parties, ch change of governments, what? Regime. Regime. And um, he's now a free man. So uh, some people come to him and uh, they are looking for money. They want a contribution for their charitable cause. And they meet Prince Andre and Prince Andre says, well, I don't really handle money. My niece handles the money. You see, she considers me a bit too emotional. <laughs> so here's a man who spent 17 years in a salt mine, completely self-contained and restraining his, his, his disappointments and bitterness. And then at the end of 17 years, he says, well, my niece thinks I'm a bit emotional. <laughs> and I think that this Conrad has a lot that gives you a feeling of a theory of art, that art takes so much restraint. Um, the, the creative process is a horror, horror, horror. Kurt says in the heart of darkness, what is, I always wonder what the horror is, but one of my theories, you know the story of Kurtz and the heart of darkness, that Kurtz is the western man and he goes into Africa to steal the ivory and the gold and then he dies on a boat coming out of Africa and before he dies, the narrator goes to him, Marlowe, and says, Mr. Kurtz, do you have any last words? says, yes, horror, horror, and then he conks out. And then a little black boy, he's in the boat, he, he runs out of the room, he says, Mr. Kurtz, he's dead. And this is the, the, ep, the heading of uh, T.S. Uh, Eliot's poem. He, I think it's the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kurtz, he's dead. Well, the, the horror, in a way, is this, uh, horror of creativity and you see it in Rookmacher in his alluding to uh, all of these great French thinkers that formed Impressionism <laughs> like Gauguin was influenced by many intellectuals you haven't you know about Gauguin what the unique thing is about paradise None of them are smiling. No one smiled. <laughs> paradise wasn't paradise. Here, take a picture of that. Got it. And he had to eat tuna fish from cans, and he couldn't get any free pineapples from the trees because American fruit companies owned all the pineapples. <laughs> so there he was in, tr in paradise and unhappy. But uh, apparently, Rookmacher reckons that this is indeed great art in terms of the influences and the execution, the form and the content, the, the communication of ideas Rookmacher considers important, that there, there is something that transcends the form and it is the idea where you can reach the person, person reaching person. Um, same thing here with uh, unusual painting of Goya, but it, it's down here on the bottom. Okay, a man is asleep at his desk, and he, ha he dreams an unhappy sleep, and when he dreams, he dreams of monsters, cats and birds. <coughs> but there's a caption to the painting here that you can't see, and the caption is that Spanish quote, the dream of reason produces monsters. And so uh, Goya talks to you, tells you that he has an idea, he wants you to um, relate to his words, to his idea. 
even though he's a painter. And um, who else does that? Oh, the one I love, one of my favorite painters is Edouard Manet. Edouard Manet, he's always talking to you. There's a constant conversation, sometimes very witty and uh, humorous. The one I love is a garden scene. In the garden is a lady and a man. The man has his arm around the lady. The lady has black gloves on her hands. And you don't quite know who they are. Are these lovers? Is this the artist and his model? Is this a husband and a wife? You don't know who they are, but that's part of the tension. Then behind them stands a waiter, and the waiter has in his hand a pot of coffee, and he looks directly at you, <laughs> like, what are you doing here? <laughs> This is a private party, it's none of your business who these people are. <laughs> and you talk back to him, you say, wait a minute, I'm in a museum, I'm looking at a painting, I have a right to be here. And then you realize, Manet got you. He's got you in his conversation. And you're, you're arguing with the people in the painting. I have a right to be here. I paid to get into this museum. What are you looking at me like that for? And it, it's just a marvel how uh, Manet carries you through the picture and talks to you. And I think that is part of the wholesome Calvinism of Ruckmacher. He talks to you and he say, says things that are very wholesome big ideas designed to relate to the whole person. He, he likes these uh, whole and wholesome ideas. Um, okay, uh, Ruckmacher, and now I'm going into the article that was assigned for tonight, Art Needs No Justification. Mm. It was written posthumously. Ruckmacher was only uh, 52. Uh, in 1977, he was born in 1922, so he was 55 years old, and he suddenly died. His life was not entirely happy. It was uh, kind of a, you know, modest uh, European life. He came from a good family. He had studied engineering, and then he was arrested by the Nazis, as were was his wife. And his wife was Jewish and she was killed in Auschwitz. So it was a very sad beginning to his life. And then um, he, uh, in prison camp, he learned Calvinism from a philosopher Christian. And it impressed him very much and he wanted to be a Calvinist, which is the traditional religion of Holland. And. Um, uh, he became uh, a follower of uh, Doyevierd, Hermann Doyevierd. Hermann Doyevierd is uh, a uh, uh, disciple of Abraham Kuyper, a sort of sphere sovereignty thinker. He wants to divide all of life and all of knowledge into uh, orderly encyclopedia of spheres. <laughs> so you would have you know, a biological sphere, or a floral sphere, a meteorological spe sphere, but especially <laughs> spheres of science and philosophy. And each of them would have a sort of integrity. And so it was a, a very embraceive, encyclopedic, orderly system. And at first, Ruckmacher followed uh, Doyevierd, and you can see some of this in. Ruckmacher's writing where he talks about how Christianity has to reach all of life, has to have implications for science as well as art or economics or anything, that art has to reach the whole person. Ruckmacher himself uh, studied and could write about art, meaning painting and sculpture, but also he uh, was very interested in jazz, uh, black gospel music, maybe some more things, uh, uh, modern art, and he, uh, in 1948, he met Francis Schaeffer, and he and Schaeffer collaborated, and uh, Francis Schaeffer had a ministry to the hippies, drawing 
these uh, lost souls from the streets of Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. <laughs> they had been, they were the alienated of the Ivy League. You know, a modern middle class, upper middle class intellectuals who were lost. And Schaefer had a way of talking to them, and so did Ruckmacher. And you sort of feel that about Ruckmacher. He has what I would consider kind of a almost a Marxist uh, draw. Uh, he mentions Marxism, but about three times in the article he says, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and I don't think he's heavily Marxist, but the idea of, a, of alienated classes is, is big. I, I was thinking of Charles Manson. You see, it's hard to be a modern artist unless, unless you have some hatred for the middle class, some detestation of the white middle class. So I'll give you a quote. Tell me who said this. Mr. and Mrs. White America, I see you with your white houses and your two cars. No. And in my mind, I light fires in your cities. Who said that? Mark? No. Worse, much worse. No. Sandberg's good idea, though. Very what's, good idea. What's the first part? Mr. and Mrs. White America, I see you in your white houses with your two cars and your two children. And in my mind, I light fires in your cities. Getting closer. Mm. Getting closer. If I give you one more line, you'll probably get it. You want me to give you the one more line? Who? Okay, one of the lines later is Helter Skelter is coming down. That's right, it's Charles Manson. Yeah, yeah, you said it a minute ago. So you didn't think me too? I was in Helter Skelter, I know that quote. So I thought, well, it can't be. Yeah, you already said Charles Manson, so I was like, no, I can't. Oh, that was my fault. Never mind. I take it back. I was going to say it again. I wasn't trying to trick you, but this mindset was a kind of, was a kind of mindset that Gauguin had to follow when he left the West. See, he, he had set in his bones this idea that I hate my life. I hate the smallness of it. I hate the shrunkenness of it. I hate the deformed quality. I'm going, I'm going to Tahiti. I'm going to Martinique. Good or no good? Yeah, yeah. What? What? Am I? That's all I think by. Yeah. That's it. Give yourself a lot of spice. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's what. Now that is almost. That, that's almost exactly what Rookmacher. That's what really artists feel. And that, what I'm saying is, you don't see it in this article, because this article is very genteel. He's at the end of his life, he's writing about a Swiss commune in the Alps of Switzerland. But the earlier stuff, where he's analyzing what made Gauguin, is very, very strong meat, you know. The, 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 there's great bitterness and anger on the part of the artists for their lousy lives. So what's the response? Oh, preaching. Well, I, I don't know. I don't want to deal with the hope yet. My 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 problem in in talking about something like this is that I want to provoke creativity in my listeners. Now I could review what he says, but then it would quickly become boring. You would realize that I was just, you know, just typing. Like what? It, good quote. Who said this? Regarding Jack Kerouac, he said, that's not writing, that's typing. I uh, know. We say, I'm saying that all the time. And we're on Facebook, and I'm like, sorry, the time's just wrong. Charles Manson, okay. No, that was uh, Truman Capote. Oh, yeah. Truman Capote said about Jack Kerouac. <laughs> okay. So, what are we talking about? Is that. Uh, what influenced Rookmacher? We're still in introduction. 
and let me know sometime where we are on the clock. But um, we're about twenty minutes in. <laughs> okay, there are three uh, great thinkers you want to associate with Ruckmacher in his early years. One is Doyerveerd, one is Abraham Kuyper, and the other is Klaus Gilder. Uh, Holland was splitting its church in, uh, between the Kuyperians and the Skilderians. And uh, uh, Ruckmacher fo followed Kuyper, but the Kuyperians were held to be uh, pro-Nazi and uh, uh, idealistic and kind of uh, unrealistic, whereas Skilder had been sent to concentration camp and he was thought to be um, realistic and conservative, doctrinally conservative. And this is something that you really don't ever see in Ruckmacher, is doctrine. He thinks of the Reformation as a heritage that he has somehow as a Calvinist, but he doesn't really get down to it what is Reformation. You know, justification by faith alone and the authority of the Bible. He doesn't get into that. <laughs> He's more, in that sense, he's more Kuyperian and Doyavirdian than uh, Skilderian. And by the way, Klaus Skilder um, was very influential in the founding of Kampen University that has a reputation of being more conservative than the Free University. And Ruckmacher was at the Free University, not at Kampen. And in the town square of Kampen, they have a plaque Klaus Skilder, it says on it, <clears throat> and underneath it, it says, Fides Quadrat Intellectum, faith guides the intellect, and that's Skilder, that the faith, the Christian faith has to inform the, the intellect. Anyway, uh, this is something you don't pick up in these writings, but something I wanted to mention is that uh, Ruckmacher had a background it was a little bit floaty, but um, you know, Ruckmacher, you know, had very sober skills, engineering, and an art critic. He really was a professional art critic. Um, this CD-ROM I showed you is produced by his daughter in 2005. Um, we move on. Okay, uh, move on, move on. Okay, art needs no justification. This paper was published posthumously in 1978. Ruckmacher died in 77. I had him in class in January of 1976. So I have listened to Ruckmacher. <laughs> He's a very, very nice man. Like I said, I'm trying in some way to portray to you <clears throat> some of his spirit. He, he had a even keel, but he could also be kind of European, I guess he was part Indonesian, but he didn't look very, you know, Eastern, but he could be fussy. He was like, he liked to smoke, I like to smoke, and he could be very fussy and impatient. Hurry up, hurry up, you know, <laughs> get a move on. And um, he had this sort of Marxist hatred of, of uh, uh, art that was too high, making art too much of, uh, you know, uh, a new religion. And uh, he liked the black music because he thought the black music, got black gospel music was real, came out of the heart and soul of America. It came out of slavery. It came out of poor people. And it represented authentic talent. And this sort of looking for authentic talent is part of Ruckmacher, but it's also part of Calvin, and that authentic talent is a gift of God. It can't be controlled. So where does reggae music come from? It comes from the cane fields of Jamaica. I have seen cane fields in the Dominican Republic. There's no form of humanity on earth that is lower than a cane cutter. They they cut the cane with knives, machetes, and the, the sharp ends of the, the cane cut their legs, mm. and they get infections. And so you see people, men with missing legs and missing arms because they've been poisoned 
And in the cane fields, there are also snakes and insects that hurt them. And they get paid in the Dominican Republic, they used to get paid a dollar fifty a ton for cane, and a good man could cut maybe two and a half tons a day. So on a good day, you would make four dollars. Wow. And it would not be enough to live on, but the company store would give you credit and then you could work off your credit, which means you were worse than a slave. You, you went to work every day in debt, and no matter how hard you worked, you, you just got more debt. And uh, the, the chief owner of sugar from the Dominican Republic spent his days lobbying to keep sugar prices up. His name was Jose Hool, or Van Hool. Uh, anyway, it's a nasty story about cane cutters, but from these cane fields comes this strange music, reggae. So ja set, my people no stand in the street and beg bread. Last night a stone was my pillow, a rock was my bed. This stuff was authentic, you couldn't make it up, you couldn't, couldn't be imitated. So what's his name said, Gauguin said art is either plagiarism or it's revolution. I like that. These guys have words. In other words, the, the reggae is a revolution in every way. It's revolutionary. has no origin in, in man. And this is what Calvin said, that by common grace God would distribute gifts randomly. And the gifts that God gave to certain people would be so exceptional that you couldn't mistake them as the work of man. How in the world did these cane cutters get those musical skills? I mean from nothing, a guitar and a tambourine. So this is sort of Ruckmacher too. Ruckmacher understands art as like a, a thing. It just comes to you and you can't quite explain why it's here or why you have it, but you do. And it is a, a strange combination under God's sovereignty of talent, intelligence, hard work, but it has no justification. <laughs> That's the name of the... I gotta get, I, feel, I would feel remiss if I didn't give you some idea of what this title means. But this is what it means. When, when he says art has no justification, he means it's just there. It, it has no defense for itself. It, he says, does a tree defend itself? No, the tree is just a tree. You might talk about leaves and you might talk about honey and, and, and branches, but basically a tree is just there. And the art is like that. It just appears on its own.